TV is that usually the, the, the major concept of the show already exists from whoever created the idea. So they already know that, you know, it's a story about two boys who are switched at birth and we are dealing with, they live with families that are enemies and so we're dealing with kind of a situation where ultimately these boys need to find out that they're not who they're supposed to, that they've been told they are. So we kind of have that um, mapped out for us. And um, depending on what position you're in, in the, in the, in the writing department, if you, if you are not the head writer, then you kind of have less of a problem because it's more the head writer and the producer's problem to kind of make sure that the story goes in the direction that, they, that, that the broadcaster has got and also to come up with like the, the bigger ideas whereas we can work in, on the smaller ideas. So in a writing team when we're in the room and people are discussing the story, okay, so what's going to happen? We're going to create the pastor because he's going to come over and he's going to take over. What's going to happen? So then we start throwing ideas, you know. So we, ideas come from everywhere, from Daily Sun, from the news, <laughs> from Sunday World, from your own church, from our own preconceived ideas. And it was very interesting writing for a show like Uzalo where, where I'm not a religious person. So I have my own ideas and my own things that I want to work out in the story. And then there are other people who are religious. So we work, get into the room, ideas are coming around. The person who's responsible for the story has to absorb those ideas and doesn't have to follow everything, you know, as per the moon says, okay, this pastor must then be. Doesn't mean you have to do exactly that. So they take, we absorb all of that. Then we go away and we start to come up with them the idea of what the story is. And you're going to get feedback from everyone. Um, but ultimately, the boss's feedback is the one that matters. That would be the head writer. Depending on which show you're in, the boss might be the head writer or the producer or the broadcaster might have a bit more control of the story. And once we kind of have mapped out the story, the, the next group of people that work on it, which are the script writers, the dialogue writers, they work on a template. So they are given, this is what the scene is, <coughs> a paragraph, and they take that scene and turn it into action. And, and so it's easier for them, because they don't work with a blank page. They already are given the material that they must turn into. So it's very technical, because you are, you are working with structure, you're working with um, with ad breaks, you're working with how long is your your your, your uh, episode? If it's an hour, you know, if you're four ad breaks, you know, every ad scene before the ad break has to be a cliffhanger because we don't want people to go to the ad break but switch it to another channel and never come back. You know, so it's all very, it's all very, it's not as creative and as loopy and dreamy as we all think it is. It's very, it can get very very technical. I, I can I can I can attest to that um, because so I don't have it so it's just me and the girls and um, so when it was adapted and we had to go through this whole process of turning the book into into a screenplay and you know you for for me the mo you know like you work with an editor and that's like already one too many people taking part in the story um, but now there's a whole room of people. Um, and, um, we had a scriptwriter, there was another lady before uh, Mrs. Siri took over. You have a head scriptwriter or um, an advisor, Julie Horn. You have the director, you have the producers, you know, and everybody has an idea of what this thing needs to look like. So you take you 200 and something pages into 120 minutes. Exactly, and I didn't know that. So I didn't know. I mean, I've seen, you know, I, I read and I've seen movies that are books that have been adapted into film, and I always think, okay, they didn't do justice to that. But I didn't know it was going to happen to me. <laughs> and um, all of a sudden, we're sitting, and within the first few weeks of um, deciding which of the characters we're going to, you know, to make it into the movie, I'm told that one of my characters is not going to make it. And for me, that's like a part of me has been killed, just like that, and um, and a whole lot of other storylines that I felt strongly about um, were were not part of the film. And I think for me, that was like a big. It is. It is. I needed some minor counselling by 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 the producers because she had to keep on saying, "Not nosy. We know what you're doing. Just 
which has the process, this, you know, it has to fit a certain thing. I mean, those who have seen Happiness, Happiness is more, the book is slightly different, uh, but the movie is much more aspirational, it's much more glamorous, and um, they, you know, they, they cut out all the, the, the heavy issues um, to fit into a particular, you know, a particular context. And so, so it was, it was, it was very difficult for me. So I just wondered if, do you, for you as a, as a, as a, as a screenplay writer, or a scriptwriter, do you, do you find that some of your ideas that you're like feeling strongly about, and they don't make it? Maybe the head writer decides, no, this is not the way the story is going. How do you, you know, how do you deal with that? The, the hard thing, um, you know, before you asked me that question, I was thinking, ah, it's not that difficult, you know, we just. This is we just move on to the next idea, but then, but then, as you were asking, I, I just remembered how precious I was a few days ago, not a few days, maybe yesterday or two days ago, um, because um, on the show that I'm working on now, on, on the Queen, um, I'm a storyline and I'm script editor, um, so I get to deal with the story from you know. I, from the blank page coming up with the original story and then seeing what the script writers have done and edit that. And sometimes I, I, you know, I make sure what it goes the way <laughs> that I, I, I thought it should go rather than maybe what the script writer has done. So in the last month I've taken a break from storylining because that's the heavy that's the heavy lifting of the of the system and I've been very exhausted. So I handed a storyline over to another writer and I had a particular ideas about what this new character should be doing and why they're doing what they're doing. And I'm reading the story and I'm like, ah, but this is not what goodness is supposed to be. <laughs> and I fought for the name goodness, by the way. They were like, hi, come like, I was like, goodness, man. <laughs> it's her name. <laughs> and, and quite interestingly, in my, in my uh, long-suffering novel that's still being written, there's a character called goodness as well. Um, so, so I thought Why for. Goodness? I don't know, like and and, and goodness, my band. I must actually just make sure that there's no real goodness. I'm in my it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a bit of a fascination for me for about about goodness. Um, so I, I was reading the the, the, the the script, I was editing the script, and then I was like, but why is she doing this? She's supposed to be doing something else, and then. You know, I had to calm myself down. I put in a note to just say to the to the head writer, I'm not sure where the story is going since I mean, obviously I'm not working on that story anymore. But I thought this. Um, however, I had to step back and not edit it the way that I think it should happen because I have to trust that the team and the head writer, which the head writers have already approved in the storyline, I have to trust that they know what they're doing and I have to step back and let it happen that way. So. It depends on how, for me, it's always dependent on how attached I am to the series itself. The series that I've worked on that I've never really like cared what they do, like, okay, I've written, I've invoiced the beat. <laughs> I watch it on screen, I'm like, hey, what did they do? <laughs> and then I'll, I'll stop watching after a few episodes because I'm like, you. Okay, I'm not telling people I worked on this one, but but these last two long-running series, I've been quite attached to them, and it's always harder when this thing is on the screen and it's not exactly as you, as you had, yeah as you had imagined. Yeah. Okay. Let us let us welcome Florence Masebe. She's just joining us. She's, uh, so thank you, thank you for coming. Okay, I don't think she needs introduction. Really. <laughs> so, so that makes my life a little bit easier. So Florence, um, we were just starting to talk about um, the, you know, how when you write, the difference between what you write, what you put on paper, and what gets translated into a form. And uh, I was telling them about my uh, my experience with one of my characters in the book um, being cut out and having to move from four characters into into three characters. And um, Tizila was also sharing um, about, especially when you storyline, and you know exactly what you want everybody to do, where it starts and where it ends, and then just somebody or you know, the team just comes up with a different idea. And you just like, Sometimes the actor comes up with a different Sometimes, okay. How has that been <laughs> like? Oh, that, yes. That's what I was going to bring in to say the poor writer gives birth to beautiful words, what they believe made sense. But what they give will then get torn apart by the director, 
if the director is not part of the screenplay process. And then it also gets torn apart by the producer if it means they're going to save a little bit of money by making Florence work a few days because we had to rush in and book it too much. <laughs> and then over above, so so your your characters, it could be that they were like, four women leads, so many, we won't be able to play them all. <laughs> so it could also have been that. And then um, comes the actor who sometimes is um, just not coming to the party and really didn't learn the work and just killed your beautiful dialogue. So they passed their way through and they let them. And sometimes though, um, let me step away from being also a writer sometimes myself and be the actor. Sometimes we look at the script and we go, sure. Oh, these writers, who do they think speaks like this? My character would never say that. I'm not saying that. So we, we sit during workshop and really scratch things. It says, no, tell the writers, this doesn't work. Um, they've written that my character gets on a taxi, but they've already established she's been a teacher for 20 years. What teacher has been working for 20 years and still doesn't have a son? You know? <laughs> so sometimes actors get very involved. And, and, and change things in a script. In an ideal world, at the beginning, there should be a workshop between the entire company, directors, writers, actors. Then maybe we would all have the same product at the end where the writers don't feel, what did they do? These people went and butchered my characters. I, I think I, I agree with that, especially when <coughs> when it's an ongoing it's an ongoing series like every every day I, I don't know how how easy that is for like a, like a film for example it's very important for a film i'll give you an example chavin and i took a tiny tiny little novel mm. of of less than 70 pages Ererwani. it was really really yeah. small and we needed to make a screenplay of 105 minutes out of it. It was not going to come out of, out of the 60 whatever number of pages. So we had to sit down and Chaveni would go right and come back and I go, no Chaveni, this doesn't work, let's try this. But we workshopped our script, even once we had what we believed was a script that was ready to go full. We workshopped it with a lot of the main characters we went through it ourselves every single day with Nchaveni, long before shooting. And especially because in South Africa you don't have money when you shoot. You save yourself a lot of budget by spending time interrogating your script before you get to actual shoot. So what we would have come up with and, and then questioned on set, we questioned for a whole month and added new things and, and sometimes an actor would say, I think this character is really like this. And once they started doing the character work, yeah. they fed us yeah. what to put into the script because that's a part we forget. Um, she gives back to a goodness and I take goodness and I take her further than what she thought. And I'm like, you know what? In my discovering goodness, I've also decided she's this and she's that and she's that. And if it works, the writers will take it back and make it even greater. So, so spend rather invest in more in pre-production yeah. than have to change um, a lot as you go. On. Changing as you go along makes you. Uh, uh, I don't know. You can't be, yeah, you can't be cutting and pasting your work. Then you look like you don't trust what you wrote. And, and you can see. And we can see it. That's why we say a lot of scripts, which started off as a beautiful, beautiful piece, fall flat when they get on camera because people allow too much editing to happen on the go. Uh, yeah, I know that. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, no, no, no. I, 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 <laughs> and it's very different from, yeah. from screen because, yeah. because when, you, when you're writing your novel, when you're, when you're writing your novel, you've got the time. Yeah. Um, a novelist and a short story writer has the time that a television writer doesn't have, and often, quite often, quite lately, 
even the screenwriter, the film writer doesn't even have that time anymore because we're working in particular funding models. So when you're writing your novel, you've got the time to actually go, there's a reason why there were four women as opposed to three. And this is what this woman brought that these other women didn't bring. And then you get to the part where now we're translating it for screen, and on screen, from casting, from whatever, the fourth character starts to look, to look exactly like character number two. And then, you know, we start to make those kinds of decisions, which are, which I'm pretty sure are heartbreaking for the screen, right? But you know, for the tele, for the TV writer, it's like, there's no budget. Yeah. Where are we gonna, where are we gonna put that person? Yeah. yeah, okay, so, I know, now I know. Um, so, for me, looking back at, at, at happiness, um, so I felt there were a lot of things that made the movie a success. Um, I mean, they marketed the hell out of it. We, it was everywhere, and they didn't have a budget. It was uh, really the power of networks and, um, and, and, and being creative about the marketing. But one of the other things that I felt worked for it is because the core writing team and the director, we were all black. So we got the story. We didn't have to justify anything. We all knew this is this is the product and this is the journey for this product. Do you and and, and this is directed to you, Flo, with Ellen Did you um do, do do you think that working with your team? Because I imagine it was predominantly black as well. Did that? make life a little, does it matter? Uh, maybe for you as well. It, it matters that. a lot because half the time with our legacy of storytelling in this country, we find ourselves telling black stories through white lenses and voices and platforms and it's a slug. The paper you're writing it on is not yours. The voice you're using is borrowed. The pen is given to you by Kukemur. Everything is... <laughs> So you are borrowing so much by the time the story goes out, it's not you. And, and, and that was the case when I started out in the industry, we were literally, if you think back to all the amazing classics that you watched on television in the 80s and the 90s, and, and, and even you know, towards early 2000, it was John Rogers. It was uh, 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 the, the Peterson, Philo Peterson. Mm -hmm. It was Cape Waterfront Television. Yeah. It was all white producers, white directors, white head writers. Yeah. In fact, when I started working at Generations, the head writer was Elsha Stark. When I joined the writing team at Generations then, there were no other black people on the team. It was all white people telling you what blackness is <laughs> so now we're fortunate i mean you have to be one of the luckiest novelists i know that when your book was getting turned into a screenplay you were part of it <laughs> that kind of fortune doesn't come by often because you find people just pick your work and then they go and tear it apart in Erewhoni, we were saved by the fact that both Mchabeni and I had a big duty to say this is the first time ever a feature film has been done in Chivenda. We've got the fortune of having rights to the first ever novel written in our home language. If we don't do it justice, we should not set foot in Venda again and say our own names out loud. So we wanted to make sure that that's done right. But of course you had arguments with the production team because production team is thinking, they want what? That costs money, they can't have it. You, you can't go there, you, you, you know, they'll tell you your locations are too far apart, move it, shoot it here, do this. If we were not as stubborn, they probably would have told us to shoot Erewhon in a park in Mahalisberg. <laughs> you know? which is something that happens quite a bit in the long-running series where 
you will say, this is free state. People are like, but that's not free state. That's out here in the bar. I know. I, I, I was told that I was, I was, I was, I was going through Toweto with a friend of mine. And she was like, oh, no, this is where they shoot. You say, this is a Kubisi. And I'm like, ah, ah, ah. No, it can't be. It can't be. <laughs> it's just like, every time now when I watch the show, yeah. and I'm yeah. like, it's yeah. a Toweto. <laughs> Not all of it. I think there are parts that are being shot. But but that's the thing. Yeah. So you imagine scenery. Yeah. You yeah. and and novelists, you are so descriptive, you poor people. You give us something so wonderful. And I go and take like you describe it Bentley, I give you an Uno. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <budget different>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, budget talks. Yeah. We forever are going budget, budget, budget. And producers, we don't want to give the budgets to anybody. We want to buy a new Range Rover. <laughs> so, <laughs> so everything goes budget, 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 and your work falls flat. So if you're not fortunate enough to have the meat of the dialogue um, uh, for a screenplay, uh, for, for a drama writer, if your meaty dialogue stays and your actors bring it alive, then you're lucky. You're safe. So everything else may not make sense, yeah. but the actors helped you stay true to the words. Has it also been your experience as well? I mean, just the diversity, the diversity of the of the, of the writing. Yeah, did yeah. You make I mean, just I mean, when I when I did start, um, I, st I started at Mubango, and it, and the head writer was was white. Um, the large majority of the writers were white, and you know then. Me and another part two, we came kind of starting to be a bit more like, like And I, in my career, I've been very lucky that the longer I've worked, the less white people I work with and the more black people I work with. Um, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but in the last two to three years, I'm working with the same set of people um, as opposed to, um, you know, largely different people in the writing room. So not only do we know each other's personal quirks yeah. so they know when i get to a certain point in the writing room they know okay so that guy leave. they carry on <laughs> they, they, or somebody will say okay no 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 six wheel and miss and redirect so we, we know each other personally and you know and know what kind of stories we like to tell um but we are also all obsessed about different things so i'm always fighting with people about and, and the differences of those things, and we are. <laughs> I even rant about it on A young person TV. a few days ago tweeted, I think this Uncle Ramani from Generations is the guy from Good is Nice. I'm like, What is an Uncle Ramani? And if you and if you're working with, with, with um, teams that are not. First of all, they're not respectful enough for that kind of thing. Yeah. Because it doesn't mean that a white writer can't get it right. They can get it right, but they have to be intending to get it right. And often that is lacking. So sometimes, and sometimes we'll be lucky enough to have on set um, experienced actors. Actors who, in, in whatever culture that the story is set in, actually know what's happening. So that when something small, is, is slightly off key either in script or either in what wardrobe decides to do or what art department decides to do, they can quickly say, you know, sorry, young man, this is wrong. Yeah. You don't do it this way. We don't wear red beads. Red you allow people to do that? Some people do. Some I like people to do. Some people do. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. No, no, no. That's another story. <laughs> but, but I mean, in some cases, you find that. that, that we are able to be saved by the people on um, set. But the, 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 the difficulty with being um, a young black writer, and because um, our industry is not very organized, almost anyone can be picked up or you can be fired and be replaced by any, any person any person who say yes um, and, and who just keep quiet and, and roll out the script as per whoever said you must do it this way. You can find yourselves in rooms where you are black explaining, where you have to explain, where where you are the one white black writer, and they will decide that they want to do la bola, and you're the one now that must go and research what la bola, how it's done, 
and you are the one who must now be the same. No, we don't do it like this, we do it like this. And then you spend a lot of time doing that instead of telling the stories that you would like to tell, you know. So, so the, the good thing, I think, with channels like Mzanti um, and even ETV is starting to produce more now, is that they are kind of opening up the space and kind of shaking the ground a little bit so that people are not so comfortable in their, in their jobs. That, that, that they realize that there are other production companies that are starting to do good work and do it very well and the audience loves the work. So they just have to now start getting things right. Okay, let me, let me put a spanner in the works. So you're talking about being the only black person in the team. Try. <laughs> Try being, <laughs> it, it, it gets deeper where, where um, everybody assumes blackness is one shape. We, we all, all you black people do this, it's in black culture. And, and I had quite a, a deep, really, really thorny issues with producers at some point on the series. I'm like, guys, you're sitting here, we are here. There is no such thing as a woman wearing black clothes when she's mourning in Venda. We don't do it. And we spend an entire year with a character wearing black. It didn't matter that we said it doesn't get done. But blacks wear black when they, they are, their husbands die, when they mourn. It's different from one place to another, to another, to another. So as you, you know, it, you write these characters, but if we, we can't always say, hey, poetic license, come on. But don't push it to a point where you are betraying the story and betraying the people whose stories you say you are telling. So when people say, no, but this isn't done like this, and they go, no, but this is how we want to do it. Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> um, so... Okay, so we'll come back to that. Let's come back to that. Um, one of the things that um, you, you mentioned in the budget, and you, you're telling secrets now about how it works. Um, looking back at, um, I, was, I was reading um, an article that was written for, there's a new movie that's coming out for The Wound which is, um, is a, is, um, is a co-writer uh, for that film, so it's a team before they complete, like as, uh, it's either at the beginning of conceptualizing the character or while the character is there and they're coming with new story arcs, if the actor gets to come and talk to the writers, they can always go away and look for more things for themselves, but you can't completely get away with zero research. One last question. I'm so sorry, guys. Um, yes, you, you raised yeah. your hand. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 thank yeah. you. It was a really nice okay. It was a really nice panel. I just wanted to pick up on, on, on something that you talked about, which I come from the academic space, so I am interested in the academic side of things. And um, I'm really concerned, you know, and something that also came up yesterday in some panels, that as black people, somehow we are accepting our minority status in this country. There's no reason why we should be asking our stories should be an alternative story, an alternative film. So while these events are wonderful, and it's wonderful to plan something in Soweto, we should never lose track of the fact that we are on our own land, we're enduring colonialization, we're enduring people who have stolen and are looting from us as we speak, and our stories should be the cinema. Other people who are minorities in our country should be the people who are organizing things in their backyard and doing alternative cinema. So I think as much as we praise and embrace, we should learn both how to praise and lament at the same time, because that's really what we, we're trying to accommodate at the same time. You know, and I think for me, the, the question of landlessness, of what it means to be a conquered people, or a people enduring conquership, it's inseparable from how we speak about our capacity to tell stories, to create cinema, to shape narrative, to structure, and infrastructure of imagination amongst our people is inseparable to the condition that we have to endure today. So I, I, I also think, thinking radically, the idea that we need to supplicate and beg rich, progressive white people to please accept our story is not something that we can accept. I think artists should be servants of the state, they should be paid, and they should be the alternative. <laughs> 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 Um, to ask, we, we mentioned, but it was such an exciting 
We are, we are still here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>